So I liken actually the difference between AGM and lithium ion to the difference between coal-fired power stations and nuclear. Leave your supplies with just two water tanks. So you're coming in from the port of starboard water tank and you're going to the main pump and backup pump. I think that's one of the things that people neglect to do on these boats is run them wide open. You really need to open these suckers up. The first question that I get from almost everybody is how much does it cost to run an old home? Good afternoon and welcome to Nordhaven Central. I'm James Knight and we're here in uh, Palm Beach Gardens, Loggerhead Palm Beach Gardens on the dock at uh, uh, B Dock behind uh, 68 uh, migration here and as you look down the dock you'll see that we've been gathering Nordhavens together here over the past couple of months. We've got a 55 next to it. 55 number 9 Moxie, it's been looking after for a few years and uh, 64 09 coincidentally and then uh, ammonite has appeared also we brought ammonite in here since we did the video she's under contract and uh, heading towards a closing and then way out at the end of the dock there you can see bravo is actually in here too she's under contract since the video uh, on the left side of the dock we've got a 40 out at the end then there's a 52 down there halfway down and also the 57 that we did the video on aquaholic is in here as well so we've been gathering them all together and we are going to do a 55. Matthew and I tried to do a 55 a couple of months ago. Um, it didn't work out so well. The weather was bad, and amongst other things. But we do have this beautiful 64 here that's all opened up, covers off, and uh, she's actually under contract right now. I just thought it would be a good opportunity to give you a tour around a 64. Uh, I won't say one of my favorites, but she sure is a nice looking boat. So come on in and I'll show you around. So again, I'm James Knight, Yacht Tech, and I know that a bunch of you probably have been pinged because we put another video up. It's been uh, several months now since we've had an opportunity to put a video together. Um, this is a very busy time of year for uh, us at Yacht Tech. I've been traveling a lot, more than I care to uh, admit actually with COVID and everything going on. But um, business has been brisk and uh, you got to do what you got to do. So. A lot of traveling, a lot of boats uh, have gone to uh, uh, contract over the past month or two. It's been a bit hectic. Uh, in fact, like I said, outside on the dock, this one's under contract and uh, you know we're getting ready to pass her off to her new owners. This, like many of the other boats that we've been selling recently, uh, did not go to Yacht World. We didn't put it online. We have, um, since we started doing the videos, we've got a ton of people, uh, thank you, uh, for calling and emailing um, and messaging. I, we've had a ton of people that have called up and said, hey, we really appreciate what you're doing and we're looking for a boat. And so we've got a list. We've got lots of lists actually. And we've got lists of people who want us to do videos on 68s and 55s and all the other models out there. And you know, we just, unfortunately this time of year, we don't really have time to do it. It's quite time consuming putting these together. Matthew has, has to work pretty hard. Um, uh, doing uh, not just the day of filming but uh, putting it all together and editing out all my screw-ups so um, hopefully we can get this one out to you in short order um, I'm headed back to Washington in a few days um, but this is an ideal opportunity on an absolutely stunning boat um, I've got to be careful that I don't say this is one of my favorites but I gotta say it really is it really is one of my favorites I mean the, the six there's not much not to like about the 64 it's not as fast as the 62 and the 57 um, but you know the, the inside layout of the boat the the beefiness of the boat the uh, the uh, um, the profile of the boat the profile is fantastic let's just start there when you look at a 64 at anchor she doesn't look, she's a modern modern design Nord oven. She doesn't look like some of these other boats that uh, they do sort of have that wedding cake look. Some people have commented on, on them looking top heavy and the wedding cake style. The 64 actually is beefy, it's beamy, and, and it's relatively low profile. In fact, I would say that it's as close to the perfect profile as you can get for a forward pilot house Nord oven. And <clears throat> So the original owner of this boat, Eric, 
6409, he took his family across the Pacific on this boat to Australia. He homeschooled his son, and uh, when he brought it to me, um, I was I was actually blown away that he listed the boat for sale with me. We did put it online, that was quite some years ago now. We sold it to the second owner, um, Greg, and Matthew actually came with me, didn't he? We went to the Bahamas. When Greg bought the boat, we spent about 10 days in the Bahamas with him. And that was really my first experience on the 64. Um, getting it over into the Bahamas, of course, it's a fairly deep draft for the Bahamas, six foot uh, 10, uh, somewhere between six, 10 and seven foot, you know, when you fill it up with fuel. 3,300 gallons of fuel on this boat. Um, but my appreciation for the boat uh, really came to be during that first trip and the space. So when Greg came to look at this boat, um, he actually called me up and said, James, I don't understand. There's a $1 million difference in price between the 62 and the 64. How is it possible that uh, for two feet, you're, you're asking another an extra million dollars, I and mean, it's twice the price, basically. I said, Greg, you gotta get over here and have a look, um, and you'll understand. And sure enough, uh, I showed he and his wife, Lee, around the marina, and uh, at a number of different Nord Islands. We ended up on this boat, um, and I took him out for a spin on it, and uh, he was sold. He understood the difference. So, it may only be two feet longer than the 62, and it may only be one foot longer than the 63, but it's a huge difference. It's beamier, it's deeper, it just, it's beefier. It's a much, much bigger boat. Um, and I'm gonna show you around so that you can see what I mean. Uh, there's a lot of things that I really like about this boat. There are a few things that I don't like, uh, as with all of them. Not too much on the 64, but I'll point them out to you. So the first thing we're gonna do is uh, head off around the deck. I'll show you the outside of the boat. It's nice and sunny out there. We're in South Florida, Palm Beach Gardens, and uh, it, it has been warm. I got the doors open, the air conditioning on right now. That's a very American thing to do. But uh, it was getting a little warm in here, so. Um, but I, I think having the doors open, look at these doors. We actually, uh, we actually put the stainless steel bottoms on these doors uh, when Eric had the boat, because as with um, a lot of the Nord Havens that have wood, trim on these doors that the wood tends to go dark on the bottoms and uh, rather than reskin the doors I said uh, do you mind if we just put some stainless steel on the bottom and that was a long time ago now and uh, it's still there so that's actually hiding a little bit of black wood at the bottom that I just thought it was more appropriate to do stainless steel. So we're going to go on out and I'll show you a couple of things out here. So one of the first things you're going to notice here when I try and open this up It doesn't quite fit. Well, that was sort of short-sighted, wasn't it? Anyway, um, start off with something negative. But it's there, and I just noticed it again. I, I, we don't normally have this door open, so it doesn't really pr present a problem normally. Uh, but I had it open for the video, and I thought, oh, that's good. I remember that. The other thing that I really don't like about these 64s, because they have these short cockpits, is when you've got the hatch up, and you're working in here and you're in and out, you've got a nice ladder down there to the lazarette. It's kind of ridiculous because there's no way around the back of the hatch. So if you've got both hatches up, you're stuck and you're climbing across the cushions, which is really annoying. So you have to have one hatch open and one hatch down. And I've discovered that if you have the aft doors open, then you can go around the back swim step there. All right, let's have a look at this back swim step. So it's really nice to have these Beefy doors, that's going to be the word of the video, beefy, because this boat is beefy. Not quite as solid as the 62, but it's definitely dashing style. It's heavy, heavily built. Um, propane locker back here. access to the swim step. Now, I'm going to send Matthew a picture. This is 6409. Uh, Frank and I sold 64 number 10 uh, to uh, Kimball and Vicky um, about a year and a half, coming up two years ago. And the first thing we did on that boat, uh, with the help of Aaron and, in, um, and Justin in Anacortes, was put a big swim step on the back because uh, Kimball wanted to fish and 
This is not an ideal fishing boat because you've got the overhang here. There's really no room to, to have a rod and the swim step is rather narrow as you can see. So the first thing we did was have Aaron come and measure up and uh, we put a big swim step on the back and I'm gonna have Matthew post a picture so that you can see it because that really set this boat off. And I think every 64 should have a swim step on the back. So it makes it an ideal fishing platform. And I can tell you when it was parked in the marina there at Cap Sante, everybody that walk, walks past the back of that boat loves it. We took the name off of this one recently. She's gonna be renamed here shortly. There's a little swim step underneath this hatch that drops out so you can climb up with your swim gear on, with your dive tanks. There is a dive compressor on this boat. Uh, I'll show you shortly down on the last. Uh, deck shower for rinsing off right here and and access to the boat deck up through this hatch here. Now that hatch does drop down and latch. It's got dogs on it so you can latch it down in, in place. Um, just some storage areas there. Good spot for putting the canvas and a super nice grilling area which thanks to Matthew is all nice and clean and polished. That's kind of nice, isn't it? Actually, Jason put that in. I think Jason from, uh, who used to work down here, but he's up in Anacortes now. You've seen him in one of the other videos. Jason put this grill in, and I think Jason put a similar grill in on Gratitude, another 64 that we sold a few years back, which is over in the Mediterranean, Alec and Laurie. Uh, more storage under here. Uh, warping winch. Oh, and look at this control station. So, <clears throat> I did use it the other day when we were backing in here. I didn't actually back in with it because it's quite honestly, you know, backing the boat and using this station, you can't, it's very difficult to see what the bow's doing from here. So, that's really doesn't get a whole lot of use for that. But if you were pulling up stern two and doing med mooring or something, maybe over in the Mediterranean, this is pretty nice. You've got control of your windlass as well, so you can let the hook out while you're backing up to the dock. Um, it's really nice to have the steering station as well, although you do have bow and stern thruster. And one thing that I can sure say about the 64 is the bow and th stern thruster are uh, suitably sized, to say the least. They have lots of power, and they're full hydraulic boat, of course. And um, there's more than enough power to put the boat exactly where you want it. And coming into a slip like this, even though it's rather tight, uh, is really a piece of cake. Okay, and so on up the side deck. Fuel fill, I won't say too much about it, but it doesn't have a catch. It doesn't have a little catch basin like we discussed before. The vents are all in here. So with teak decks, which I know a lot of people don't like teak decks, and unfortunately, if you do spill fuel, guess where it goes? Right on top of your teak deck. That's nice. A little tip, wet the decks down before you fuel. And that way, if the teak is uh, soaked with water, at least the diesel floats on the water and doesn't soak into the teak. It helps, if you spill it. All right, so, um, there are mosquito screens, uh, phantom screens on all the doors, which is nice to have. Uh, Dutch doors, a little bit of corrosion here and there, but remember this boat has been around. This boat's been across the Pacific to Australia, and um, it's a 2000, what did I say it was, 2008? It's 2008. Um, sort of a little catch area here. This is uh, water, actually, and then fuel. There's a little bit of a catch area in there, but not enough for anything more than a dribble. Oh, okay, so I did want to point out one thing. They got the width of the walkway correct on this boat. They didn't have to put a cutout in for the, uh, for the door to swing. So it's a nice wide walkway. Catches on all the doors, Dutch doors here as well. That's sort of annoying, you know, if you, if you hit that on your way past it hurts. But, you know, I think on some of them we put in a, a little block there so that you you hit the block and not the catch. That'll do a number on you. And control stations on port and starboard, as you would expect. Now this is where I think that the 64 does look a little bit funky, but it's 
um, it's all very functional. So these rails are quite high. When you're sitting in the wheelhouse looking at this bow, it's all very close. In fact, I had Carl and Nora from the uh, 63 on here the other day, went out for a sea trial, and they said, huh, it's very strange sitting in their helm seat looking at the bow, and the bow feels like it's right here after being on a 63 when you're in the uh, pilot house looking at your big long foredeck. So here you sort of look out of these windows and you can't see very much because the bow is high and the railings are high and it all feels like it's right in front of you. However, Maxwell 4500 windlass, beefy. Chain stoppers, I think the second one has been added. Chain brake, beautiful ultra anchor there. Forward shore power inlets just in case you tie up bow first, but this boat does have twin glen dinnings. I don't know if you saw that as you were walking up at the stern there, as we were walking up at the stern. Um, it has twin glen dinnings for uh, shore power and air conditioning. Look at this cable. I mean, seriously, seriously. This is, is what you would expect to see holding the rig up on a, you know, 50 foot sailboat. It's a bit overkill actually. Sometimes I think that they overdo things, but there you go. All right, this is all storage here. There's storage for cleaning gear. Another control station right here. Um, I think I was in exactly the same spot when I said PCM, PMC, Pacific Coast Marine. Frames, window frames, no corrosion. They're actually, they look really good. The doors don't look too bad either. It's nice to have these upper boarding doors when you tie up in the Bahamas or something and it's a, uh, 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 a fixed dock with pilings. It's quite high, but at low tide you'll appreciate that. So this had originally had a maroon colored stripe and uh, Greg redid that when he bought the boat. Uh, that was the uh, second, um, second owner. Um, okay, so in here we've got a uh, fuel tank for refueling the dinghy. With a little fill right, 24 volt uh, fuel pump. And then over here, this is something that I really like. There is a little garage. And I think I remember Matthew cleaning this out one time with Hunter. Some years ago, right? Same boat. So, um, and so in here there is, uh, I can find the light switch. Yeah, check that out. So 110 volt lighting, actually it's all been LED-ified on this boat. So, um, you know, you can store your dive gear up here, but all your, you know, toys, little board there, spare uh, fuel tanks, lines, flags, what have you. And then, actually, this is a fairly new AB on the boat. I, we launched it the other day and took it for a spin. Um, it's sort of... It's almost undersized for this boat. Originally this boat, just like Vicky J out in Anacortes uh, hull number 10, had an athwart ship's um, Boston Whaler. I think it was a Whaler 15 with a 70 on the back. Um, but that's long gone and then uh, Vicky J now I think has a 15 foot AB on it. This is uh, considerably smaller, I think maybe 13, 13 or 14. And a massive, so it was like launching a little, little toy the other day when we launched the, the dinghy with this 2,000 pound crane. So this is a telescoping crane and actually you can pick this little dinghy up and no problem at all and swing it around. You can launch it on starboard, you can launch it on port and we launched it across the transom which if you put the swim step on the back may not be possible but uh, right now with that short swim step uh, quite easily it can reach around the back and drop that dinghy right off of the uh, back of the swim set, which in in conditions uh, like we had the deck the other day where it was quite windy and choppy is is nice because right behind the boat of course it's sheltered so if you have to drop it one side or the other then the waves are going to be banging it around and it's a bit more awkward but if you can drop it right over the stern in the shadow of the of the boat it makes it a lot easier all right and uh, on up to the library So, there's some storage in here, uh, a lot of storage actually, and 
this is kind of funky. It's, it's a nice area, a little, sort of a small table, um, but you don't get a very good view of where you're going. What you can see out to the sides, you can see the horizon off to the sides, um, but I suppose the advantage is you're out of the wind down here. That's quite nice. Um, but you can't really see where you're going. But if you want to see where you're going, look at these stids, man. I mean, you can't beat that. Three beautiful stids. There's probably, uh, I hate to guess, probably $18,000 worth of stids. I shouldn't say that, should I? But I did. They're expensive. And look at the view. I mean, so when we were on our sea trail the other day, I was up here running the boat in the blue water, looking out, and I tell you what, this is a commanding position. You've got the hard top, uh, lots of real estate up there for uh, antennas, and of course a lot of people are looking at solar panels these days. Solar panels don't do a whole lot for you on a boat like this, but everything helps. And this nice array of instrumentation, you want to come through here? And it's all nice and cleanly laid out. We've got our autopilot right there. And uh, engine controls, thrusters. That's the wing engine control right there. You coming back? <laughs> I'm trying to stay out of the wing. You don't know where you want to be. Oh, you've got a wing engine uh, um, cluster right there. So you can see your uh, tack and your oil pressure and stuff. And then there's one for the main engine. We've got the two VHFs here, uh, the stereo control. And uh, chain counter, stabilizers, active and centered, and you can control your one of the TZs from up here, and then you've got a nav, uh, uh, nav computer also PC down there with time zero on it, and your depth. And then in here, there's a little refrigerator also. So there's a little drinks refrigerator in there. And a sink. Not quite sure why you need a sink up here, but it's handy for, you know, wiping things down. Or rinsing your glasses out, I guess. I, this is awesome. And being able to come up here from the pilot house without going outside. So that's one of the downsides to the 55 behind us here. Um, I, I love the 55, but when you want to go to the flybridge, you have to come out through the side door and come around and you can see the steps up the back there. So you have to come up the steps to the flybridge. There's no way of getting to the flybridge unless you come outside. Whereas this boat, like the 57, of course the 57 Aquaholic that we did, uh, that was the first video we did, is sitting right there. You can get out to the flybridge uh, through, we should do a walkthrough of that boat now because it's completely changed. That would be cool. Maybe we should take you guys for a quick spin around the Aquaholic now that it's been uh, um, cleaned up. It was clean before, but it's beautiful now. It's amazing what you can do with a little bit of cash. So. Come on down and check out the pilot house. I'm quickly realizing that this is becoming one of my favorites. Look at this. I mean, it is fantastic. It really is. This pilot house is huge in comparison to the 63. I mean, I love the 63, don't get me wrong. And I like being at the back of the boat, but this is, this is something else. I mean, it really is. In fact, I think even Carl and, Carl and Nora will tell you. Um, you know, they, they really enjoyed being out on the boat for the sea trial. You just feel that you're on such a big boat and it's only a foot longer. It's very strange. So there's a, uh, a little, um, bunk back there, off watch bunk with a curtain around it, um, which is actually quite, a, quite a nice little spot to, to sleep. Do you remember this? Yeah. That's pretty cool, isn't it? An off-watch bunk, so you can be close by, and you can close the curtains and make it all nice and dark in there, but you're really quite close to the action. Okay, so I'm gonna do something here that I don't think we've done on any of the other videos. And I don't really know if you'll get an idea of, of the sound, but I'm gonna start the engine. And I don't think we started the engine on any of the others, did we? So, Listen carefully. Because I did this the other day, and the people that were buying the boat, they came on board and I said, you want to get a, an idea of the sound level? And of course they did, so I started it, and they were blown away by how quiet it was. 
we're gonna uh, we're gonna start this engine and then we're gonna take a little trip down to the engine room so you can hear the difference um, we didn't do this on the other videos but um, it's fresh in my mind on this boat and it is quite remarkable uh, the engine down there has started life I think as a 400 horsepower MTU Series 60. Um, I know that there are people that are skeptical about the Series 60 uh, in a Nordhaven, but on I have worked on a bunch of these boats now that have MTU Series 60s and I, I actually have come to really appreciate these engines. Alright, so um, I station active. Okay, we are running. And I'm not even sure if you can hear that, but we're going to head on down because I haven't changed my vocals at all. I'm speaking the same way. You can have a normal conversation. Um, I'll raise the RPMs in a few minutes. In fact, let's just uh, raise the RPMs a little bit now to a sort of a cruise RPM. It's a little less than cruise because I, I need the engine to warm up. Um, but there's about uh, 1,000 RPMs right there. And so Matthew's gonna follow me down and we'll open the engine room door. And don't worry, we're gonna come back and do the galley and the, and the state rooms and everything. I'm telling you, it blows me away how quiet it is in the pilot house and the master stateroom with that engine running. That's a thousand RPMs right there. So if we were running the boat in calm water at a thousand RPMs, we'd probably be doing about six and a half, seven knots. Probably burning about three to four gallons an hour, maybe four and a half. Okay. So <laughs> this is telling me that we're burning two gallons an hour, but because it's not under load, we're actually not in gear. So that's two gallons an hour at a thousand RPM. So yeah, maybe four. Um, incredibly efficient. Okay, and uh, as you can see, a, a beautiful array of electronics. This boat has been um, worked on. Uh, the second owner did a lot of work on the boat. The third owner, Pete, did a lot of work on the boat. Um, and then, well, you know what? We, we've been very lucky with this boat. The original owner, Eric, brought it to me. And I actually, I, I didn't know him before he listed the boat with me. Um, he brought it into P Palm Beach Gardens. He shipped it back from Australia, actually, uh, to um, New Orleans, I think, and then brought it into Palm Beach Gardens and brought it over to me. And I said, Eric, it's very appreciative of you bringing the boat to me to sell. How come, uh, how come you brought it to me? Because I didn't know. It. And he said, James, you've always been there for me over the years. Um, you've always answered my emails, my phone calls, um, and you never sent me a bill. And so he felt that it was only fair to give me an opportunity to sell the boat. And that has paid dividends because I sold the boat for him. And then we sold the boat for Greg. And then we sold the boat for Pete. And then we sold the boat for the next owner and, then, and so on and so forth. And so I've got to know this boat quite well. And the last couple of times we sold it, of course, it, uh, it didn't really hit the market. So we've got this list of people that uh, are uh, there that we know want to buy Nord Islands. So there you have it. Um, recently had a, a, a lithium ion system put on it by a JM, we'll call them. Lithium ion controllers here. I'm still trying to get my head around it. I am not very familiar with lithium ion. I am learning um, and I've learned a lot recently because I need to get my head around this boat now that we're selling it to, because the new owner needs to know how it works. Um, so I am familiar with the Victron controls, but I wasn't particularly familiar with the way lithium ion charges and works. So I've been doing my homework. I'm more of a AGM guy and I understand that and so I liken actually the difference between AGM and lithium-ion to the difference between coal-fired power stations and nuclear somewhere along those lines
maybe that's an exaggeration, but that was my thinking the other day. Anyway, um, so we got two water tanks, 250 gallons a piece, so a total of 500 gallons of water. What did I say? 3,300 gallons of fuel, giving this boat a cruising range of somewhere between three and 4,000 miles. Um, you all know by now probably that most Nordhavens cruising range for uh, the bigger Nordhavens is about 3,000 miles. If you tone it down, if you throttle back a little bit, you can easily get 4,000 miles and probably more if you have good weather. Um, grey water system, it's got the tank sentry, sentry grey water system, uh, black water, 150 gallons of grey water, 150 gallons of black water, um, keyed right here so the Coast Guard can't give you a hard time for leaving the, leaving the black water valve open. Um, we got a 16 kW generator, a 25 kW generator. These have uh, 5,500, almost 5,500 hours on the 16 and uh, just over 4,000 on the 25. If you're running all the air conditioning, oh, ding. Um, going back to lithium ion, one of the reasons that, uh, that JM put lithium ion on this boat is because he wanted to be able to run this boat at anchor without, with the air conditioning on, overnight, without running a generator. And when I heard about that, I said, yeah, good luck, because it's got a chilled water system with three chillers. But in actual fact, he tells me that it is doable. Now, I haven't seen it with my own eyes, but he tells me it's doable. So you can actually run an air conditioning chiller all night with the air handlers uh, and uh, without running a generator. Now, that's pretty cool, right? So, um, and when you do recharge the batteries, you've got two Victron um, Quattros down there and two uh, ex extra Victron chargers. And I think for a total of like 600 amps, perhaps 600 amps going into the batteries. So you can recharge that lithium bank pretty quickly, minimizing your generator runtime. So I'm looking forward actually with the new owners, hopefully to uh, go on a trip with them and go and experience this lithium system for myself. Um, because obviously it's the way of the future. All right, what else have we got? Anything else to talk about here? No, uh, Simrad steering, I quite like. Uh, there's TZ systems, two of them. Nav computer underneath, big commercial radar, um, new VHF, ra I mean, oh boy, there's a lot of nice stuff on this boat. Okay, um, the cushions were all redone as well, and uh, the beds and the mattresses, exterior cushions, you saw them upstairs on the flybridge. Um, the, the boat, as I said outside, has a full hydraulic system. So similar to Ammonite's control panel, actually up here you've got uh, it's the main engine, start ignition, main engine uh, D-deck here. This is for the wing engine, the uh, Murphy, it's got a John Deere uh, wing. And then we've got main and wing hydraulic pumps. It's got hydraulic alternators. Some people may be uh, commenting on hydraulic alternators. We'll talk about those when we get down to the engine room. Uh, the windlass, emergency uh, windlass, hydraulic windlass, hydraulic emergency bilge pump. So that's like a damage control pump. We talked about, I think, on Ammonite. Uh, anchor wash pump for cleaning the chain when it's on its way up. Um, that's for the capstan on the starboard aft deck. So we've got pump monitors here so you can see whether any of your pumps are running. Oil change fuel, gasoline, fresh water pump, backup pump, engine room sink, sump, gray water and holding tank. And then you've got your battery controls here so you can turn all your batteries on and off. Uh, ship's ventilation. Um, unlike some of the other boats, I think I said that the 62 ventilation system sucked. The uh, ventilation on the engine room in the engine room of the 64 is actually pretty good. You've got some pretty big fans. They are basic Dayton blowers still, but there's a big Dayton blower up in the stack area here that sucks all the heat out of the engine room. Does a pretty good job of it too, so it keeps it fairly cool down there. And then there are small blowers in the forward bilge and the lazarette. Uh, there's vent dampers in there that are tied into the uh, fire suppression system, so that if the fire suppression system goes off it shuts the vent dampers closes down the vents in the engine room so you don't lose your fire suppressant if the bottle goes off uh, bilge pump controls sea fire obviously dimmers this alarm silence here so if you do get a bilge alarm you'll get a pretty obnoxious alarm going off and you can silence it here with this button and then you can turn the lights off because those are quite bright at night in fact they're a bit too bright but, so you can turn them off with that button very thoughtful and it's all at hand 
great speaker system in here the previous owner put in this nice fusion stereo so with bluetooth so you can uh, listen to your music from your phone up in the flybridge back on the aft cockpit and also here in the pilot house so here i am in, in the uh, salon and i gotta tell you there's a lot to like about this salon so uh you know, I got the cameras up on the TV there. You probably can't see because of the reflection in the, in the blinds here. But uh, it's got electric blinds like Bravo. And uh, <clears throat> this salon is wide. I mean, unlike some of the other boats that we've been on, Ammonite, even Ammonite actually, Ammonite's a big boat, but it almost seems like the salon is not as wide. And I think it's partly to do with the fact that there's no built-in furniture in this boat. Um, You've got cupboards on the port and starboard side, and the cupboards are only probably a foot, maybe a little bit over a foot deep. And then you've got this really comfortable couch here, and you know, you've got an easy chair over there on the other side, on the port side, and then you've got the bar stools. I just, I love the way it's set out. And then Jason made these tops for the uh, Ottomans. So you've either got your Ottoman, or if you want to have a table, put that over the top. I think the owner of the boat wanted to take those with him actually. Thank you Jason, you did a really nice job of making those. Jason made an appearance in the 62 video. Uh, he's actually up in Anacortes right now uh, doing uh, refinishing tabletops for several clients uh, who are coming in this spring to pick up their boat. So he's busy doing that. And here I am lazing around on the couch down at Loggerhead. Anyway, all right, so we're going to move on. This, uh, this boat if the original owner is looking or even the second or third owner is looking you're going to notice some differences because the last owner of the boat took out some uh, glass tiled doors in certain places and put in some beautiful uh, matching uh, wooden doors that were a little less a little less glitzy than the, than the tiled stuff um, and also the countertops have been changed. So this is a, a concrete countertop that actually, when I first saw it, I wasn't so excited about it. But I tell you what, I am now. The more I look at it, the more I like it. And so some of the things uh, actually go back to uh, Greg and Lee. This here was put in by Joe, their interior designer. This is petrified wood. Um, I saw the bill for that when it came in and I was horrified at the expense. It was unbelievable. Anyway, um, I'm glad to see that it's been left there by every owner since and uh, it's still looking pretty good. Viking range looks really nice. And then this sink, this is what JM put in and uh, I really like that as well. Um, it's called the shape and uh, the way they put it in in the corner there. There's a big corner cabinet down here. Uh, it's all got all new appliances. There's a dishwasher and a trash compactor behind Matthew. This was put in uh, by the second owner, Greg, new microwave. And then we've got the Sub-Zero there with the uh, freezer drawers top and bottom. A couple of other things that I noticed while I was walking around. you got to have a VHF radio in the salon when you're cruising. Because when your uh, shore party is... Uh, back there on the beach, out in the dinghy, and you're sitting here watching a movie, you want the uh, radio close at hand, right? So that was really thoughtful to put in, a little command mic there. And another thing that I noticed while Matthew was changing the battery and the camera was the pantry. You know, a bit like Ammonite, I mean, Ammonite has a ton of pantry space. This boat has that nice roll-out pantry also. A very good use of space. And I love these little aircraft latches that Nordhaven uses. I remember when they started using them and Trevor sent me a whole bag of them. All right, come on down, we're gonna to head to the master stateroom. Oh, no, before we, before we go to the master stateroom, uh, this was a hanging locker, but um, I uh, actually put these shelves in here and lined everything with cedar for the third owner. I did that myself in our woodshop. Full beam master. And one of the important things to consider here on a forward pilot house boat, as opposed to um, the 68, which is next to us, the Arc Pilot House 68. And we'll talk about that because that boat actually came out of the same mold as the 64. 64 came first, of course. Um, and these forward pilot house boats put your master stateroom in the middle. So we're in the middle of the boat here, which obviously, if you're, on, if you're planning on crossing oceans, this is the right place to be. This bed is in the middle of the boat. Um, the aft pilot house boats, they have the master stateroom up forward, and nobody really wants to be in the bow of the boat unless you're training to be an astronaut. All right, 
Um, and so it's a full beam master with a king bed. This is the granite that used to be in the galleys, the same stuff. They didn't change these, but uh, I still think that uh, the galley looks a lot better actually now with the, with the concrete in it, a lot more modern. It's my feeling anyway. So uh, woodwork is beautiful. And we have the option to come right through. Lots of storage, by the way. I mean, I could, sh I could open up all these cabinets and show you. Pretty typical of uh, a Nordhaven cedar lined hanging lockers. Actually, there is a light up here. You can't really see it, but uh, there's a lights in all of these lockers. You've got lockers down here, drawers, massive amount of storage space. Oh, and in the master head here. Yeah, this is big too. Um, the shower, interestingly, the shower, you can come on in too, because it's so big. Matthew and I can get in the bathroom together here. You go over there. I'm going to close this door. Solid doors, just like you saw on the 63. Although the 63 is a China boat, this is a uh, this is a tai Taiwan boat, Tashing. And so, what is interesting here is this shower in the master stateroom. Is I mean, it's okay. There's room, but when you see the guest shower up forward, you're going to be blown away. There's, it makes this one look rather small, actually even though you could probably get two people in here. So, um, not, nah. you, you'd think that, you know, you might want to get two sinks on a boat like this, but anyway, let me open this door back up and we'll, we'll move forward. He's got his entertainment system up here and there's all kinds of stuff in the cupboard, but you can also, um, and there's a ghost system on that, but we didn't talk about that, but uh, uh, the last owner put a ghost system on and there are actually beams on the steps outside, so if you, cut, if you put your foot through the beam, it'll set the alarm off. Now uh, we are in the starboard guest cabin, right here, and the original owner of the boat, his son, uh, had this as a, a desk area for doing his homework because he was doing his homeschooling on their trip across the Pacific and up and down the west coast. So it's a nice little desk area here and uh, again lots of storage and then you've got access when you turn around there to the forward head and shower. This is quite a big shower in here and nice and light and bright too because you've got the big hatch above. So remarkably huge and this head or area also is quite big for a guest head and shower area and then Matthew now has backed into the port guest stateroom which has a double bed here <sighs> yeah I can take a nap it is Sunday it's supposed to be a day off so the other thing that I find interesting about this particular boat is the headliners of course, you all know that Matthew's speciality, and us, we at Yacht Tech do a lot of headliners. This boat has no foam in the headliners. If you touch it, Matthew, and push on it, you'll see that this, it has no sponge to it. So I'm assuming, of course it's just an assumption, that these headliners will never fail. I don't want to give Nordhaven any ideas, because I like headliners that fail. So, no wooden floors here, it's just plywood, but uh, floors could be added, not really necessary. So, you're probably going to want to come on down here and take a look, because there's quite a lot of space down here. Okay, and so, we're not in the forwardmost hole. But we're under the floor right by the, right just forward of the master stateroom. And you're looking aft, I'm looking forward. So it's the port side here, and there's a nice shelf there for storing boxes. You can see, um, you know, all these secrets boxes here, wheelhouse secrets, um, previous owner, one of the previous owners had secrets, and, and there's a ton of spare parts on this boat, a ton. And nicely organized as well in these big bins, water maker parts, oil filters, fuel filters, and what have you. So this is the main ship's fresh water pump right here, a Headhunter Mark V. They do a good job, Headhunter. A lot of the boats have those. I think I pointed that out on Bravo as well. 
and uh, really like the Headhunter Mark V system. That's an Excalibur. Um, I'm not quite such a fan of the Excaliburs. We've had a lot of problems with them. Cost me uh, personally a lot of money changing out Mac, uh, Headhunter Excaliburs, unfortunately. Um, I think that they've got their got a handle on the, on the problems now, but boy, we had issues for a while there. Um, so those are the two fresh water pumps. So this one's 110 volt and this one is a 24 volt. Um, and then over here we've got, and this is an interesting setup here. You've got, uh, con you've got um, controls, valves for being able to select the water tanks. Um, it looks more complicated than it is, but these are your supplies. It's just two water tanks, so you're coming in from the port or starboard water tank and you're going to the main pump or the backup pump. <clears throat> and then coming out of the main pump or the backup pump, this is what goes off to the accumulator. And then if you want to polish, this is interesting, if you want to polish the water, i.e. send it from one tank to another um, uh, through a filter, you can do that through this valve. And then that goes through the return manifold there, a little bit like the fuel system on the uh, 62 and the 57. So that goes either to the port or starboard tank and then uh, you've also got the water coming in from the water makers right here so that uh, you can decide whether you want the water from the water maker to go, go to port or starboard. So if you've got a list, uh, you can actually use water to straighten, straighten the list, uh, put the water in the port side or the starboard side, um, depending on which, which side you need to uh, weigh down. So, um, and so aft of here, there's a little walkway area. You can sort of follow me in there probably. Um, off to starboard there. So this is the black water tank and you see all the hoses have been replaced with um, Shields Poly-X. I think we did that for the last owner. So Shields Poly-X on everything. Uh, really like that product, Shields Poly-X. I've, uh, I've mentioned it before. That's our hose of choice. Of course you can't get Shields Poly-X in 5 eighths. The white hose right there, that's the vent line for the black tank. And um, the vent line is always the stinkiest hose. Don't ask me why, because it's not carrying any sewage, but the vent line oftentimes is the stinkiest hose in the system. And unfortunately, you can't get Shields Poly-X in 5 eighths. You can only get it in the, in the bigger size, inch and a half there. So, and then over here, this is the gray water tank on this side. On, uh, for Alec and Laurie, when we redid their system and we put new hose on their tank, we actually put in a Headhunter uh, ozone generator. Uh, back in here and it pumps ozone into the tanks and keeps the smells down um, So we don't have one on this boat and it doesn't smell so that's a good sign um, This area back here is just another storage area. It's remarkable how much storage there is on here We've got hydraulic hoses running through here water system hoses, and then we've got uh, bronze discharge. It's gray water discharge black waters on the other side deck drains and uh, you know it's nicely lit area and again we've got uh, a lot of space for storage of spare parts and what have you so all right let me out and then on the other side over there is uh, the black water discharge yeah and a lot of spare parts as i said All right, and then we've got the wa hot water heater here, accumulator tank, and then the ship's fresh water uh, system filter over there in the blue housing. And also uh, we've got a UV sterilizer. That's what this is up in here. This is a UV sterilizer system. Um, that's the uh, ship's fresh water filter. Probably a carbon filter in there, ten to, uh, four, four by ten. Okay, and we're gonna head on back up there and we'll go to the next boat forward. So this is the forwardmost bilge on the 64 and you know as you can see I can almost stand up in here. I would say that it's probably about uh, five and a half feet uh, from floor to, to overhead here. And um, so I'd like to point out these, uh, these uh, hydraulic hoses and the um, grommets where they pass through. These are watertight um, glands that come through the bulkhead here. So the early boats we talked about 62s and 57s, you know, that didn't uh, didn't have good uh, pass-throughs in the bulkheads. You can see here they have very good pass-throughs. These are actually 
uh, I'm not sure if they're vapor tight, but they're, they're pretty heavy duty glands where, where everything passes through the bulkhead. Um, and so you can see here, this is our bow thruster tube down here. Um, so the bow thruster is housed in here. Um, this is what they call the bell housing. And then we've got a bent axis hydraulic uh, motor right there driving the, driving the bow thruster. This here is the directional valve for the bow thruster. I'd also like to point out that despite the fact that this is a 2008 boat, um, you know, these hoses, they have not been replaced. And all this looks like, not brand new, but pretty close to it. I mean, it all looks pretty nice and clean. The fittings and everything um, here are clean. The hoses are clean. There haven't been too, there has not been too much in the way of hydraulic leaks or chafe. You know, nothing really moves, even though when these get loaded up at 3,000 PSI, I told you in one of the other videos, everything sort of jumped. Um, everything's secured fairly well. Doesn't look like there's a whole lot of chafe going on down here. Everything looks good. So that's the directional valve right there for the uh, windlass, I believe. And then we have an on-off for the anchor wash pump. That's an anchor wash pump over there, the pacer pump. Okay, it's Sunday and it's getting to that time of day, so, you know, we got to keep filming, but it's time for a drink. All right, so I just want to point out a couple of different things here. So we've got uh, stabilizer access actually right here, which is good stabilizer access. So I always recommend people take a quick look at their stabilizers when they're underway every now and then. And on the starboard side, you've got pretty good access. In fact, you can climb down in there. This has a ISO boost transformer that uh, um, bumps the power up if you've got low voltage. So anyway, we've got access to this starboard stabilizer right here. And uh, you can pop in here and check for leaks and check for chafe and what have you. And actually, it does look like there's a little bit of chafe going on right there. Probably need a little bit of chafe guard on there, which we will take care of. Got to put it on the list. And uh, the directional valve is all surrounded by blue paper towels, and it all looks dry. So that's good. I am going to come back out. So what's interesting about the 64 is that Despite the fact that you got great access to this stabilizer, we should probably go have a look at the port stabilizer. That's the one that seems to get neglected. Because to get to it, you've got to take the bed apart. And the mattress has been redesigned to accommodate the top of the stabilizer. All right. Crew cabin. So now you're coming down to the crew area, which, in my opinion, is one of the nicest areas on the boat. You know, it's down low, it's forward of the master state, uh, master state room. Sorry, no it's not. It's not forward of the master state room at all. It's behind the master state room, it's forward of the engine room. Sandwiched between the two. And uh, on 64 number 10, which is the one in Anna Cortes I was talking to you about putting the swim step on, this doesn't exist, which I think is kind of a shame. It's got a utility area, which, you know, I think it's it's a shame that it doesn't utilize that space for a crew cabin like this. I mean, we've got a really nice area where you can uh, tuck yourself away in the in the lowest part of the boat. But under here, uh, there is sort of a box section under here. And in order to get to the stabilizer, no, you can't get to it through there. You have to take the bunk off and then you have to pull the top out and you can get to the stabilizer under there so it's it's a little bit awkward to get to but uh, but it's a nice bed nice area and it has its own head and shower right behind, behind you turn around J oh jay just arrived jay could you open that door please for matthew okay. thank you jay and so um this is actually a pretty nice size area too and you've got your own shower in here so if you're if you're at sea and taking a shower underway this is probably the best shower to use because again it's low down in the boat center line and uh, this would be my choice at any time for uh, taking taking a shower at sea it does not drain overboard directly um, it has it does go to the gray water tank but it is also very low in fact it's lower than the gray water tank so this 
shower and this sink and also the engine room sink you'll see in a second this little sink by the workbench in there they all drain into a sump box under Matthew's feet down there so there's a big sump box area in there and then that has a float switch in it and then when that fills up it pumps itself into the grey water tank which in turn pumps itself overboard so it's a little bit complicated but it works usually it works and so Tecma heads on this boat everywhere so there's uh, um, this head, master head, and forward head. So there's only three heads on the boat. And it's good to only have three heads, actually. The more heads you have, the more chance you have of having problems. New appliances everywhere. New, new washing machine and dryer. Little folding table here. Which is thoughtful. This was put in by Greg and Lee. Wet ice maker. One of my favorite things about the boat. And little drench refrigerator also. High quality Perlex stuff. And then there's a, a tool locker in there. So this is kind of an interesting, actually, let's switch spots. I want to talk to you about the, uh, the fuel tanks, the forward fuel tanks. So the forward fuel tanks, there's two of them, and there's a sight gauge here. This is a bit funky. Uh, there's a sight gauge here, and the forward fuel tanks, I think, are about 600 gallons a piece. Is that right, Jay? Maybe a little bit more. You're very quiet, Jay. I don't want to ruin the video. <laughs> so I think they're about 600 gallons a piece. But what's interesting is, you've only got one sight gauge. So you can only check the fuel level in one at a time. And if you go under the deck there where that starboard stabilizer is and cli climb down in there, there's a valve that you have to switch. And you can switch the valve that that sends fuel to the sight gauge from either the port to the starboard side. So if you want to check the fuel level in the forward tanks, you've got to go switch the valve because, you've, again, you've only got one sight gauge for the two forward tanks. Now, it is gravity feed. Everything's gravity feed to the supply tank. So we're going to go... This will be a, probably an hour tour of the engine room because there's a lot going on in here. And I think I'm just going to turn the air conditioning off so the pumps aren't running and then you'll be, probably be able to hear me better. But right now, the air conditioning is running and the chilled water loop is cold and there is air conditioning in the engine room. So it's actually quite cool in there. It's nice to have an air conditioned engine room. And we have an air conditioned lazarette as well, thanks to JM. I'm just going to turn all the breakers off here so that we've got a quiet engine room for our 10 cent tour. So we've got a nice stainless steel workbench. Uh, this is actually our chilled water system, tempered water logic controller. There's one of these here, and there's also one in the pilot house. So you can see what your loop temperature is. The boat has three chillers you'll see when we get back to the Lazarus. I don't know if you noticed that engine room door. You probably did when we opened it earlier, when we started the uh, engine. But it's almost like you're coming into the engine room of a, of a submarine or a Navy destroyer. I mean, look at that sucker. And when you lock this down, as Jay just did, this handle needs toughening up. But uh, when you lock this down, um, it really sucks that door in tight onto its seal and really stops the stops all the noise from getting out to the boat. So, um, so this is the day tank that I was talking about. So we got about uh, 80 gallons in that day tank. And the other day, uh, we took the boat out for a sea trial and we left at about 10 o'clock in the morning. We took the boat down to the inlet, so it was a bit slow going because we got stuck behind a barge. But um, we went out the inlet and we kind of cruised around out in the ocean. It was fairly rough out there. We got some spray over the boat. Um, and then we came back in. We went to Opal Cove. We anchored up. We had some, uh, we had some lunch, launched the dinghy. Then we came back up from Old Port Cove back to um, Loggerhead again. And it was about probably from 10 o'clock in the morning until about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And we burned... Uh, we were at 70, about 75 gallons, and we're now at 55, so we, 20 gallons. We burned 20 gallons of fuel, and we were out for most of the day. And I thought that, I, and we were running a generator all day. Uh, first of all, we ran, because it was quite a warm day, so I ran the 25kW for a while because I had all the air conditioning running, and then when we stopped and dropped the hook, I actually shut the generator down so we could have a nice quiet lunch. Um, and then we needed the 16kW to fire up the davit to launch the dinghy because it's a 240 volt davit. So we started the 16kW and uh, I ran a chiller off of that on the way back up too. So with the main engine and the generator 
most of the day, 20 gallons. It's pretty good going, huh? Now this engine started life as a 400 horsepower. Um, it says 400 on the side, but I did notice uh, that when we went wide open throttle, and by the way, at wide open throttle, we were burning about 17 gallons an hour, and I went outside with the prospective buyer of the boat and looked at the exhaust. And I think that's one of the things that people neglect to do on these boats is run them wide open. You really need to open these suckers up. Um, blast all the soot out, get them nice and hot, get the turbo working. And I can tell you, look, we were looking up at a clear blue sky, a beautiful Florida blue sky, and there was not a trace of black exhaust, nothing, absolutely crystal clean. But what I did notice was that the engine was running at 1850. Now, they're rated, I think, at 1800, uh, 400 horsepower, 1800 RPM. And the reason I think we were getting to 1850 is because I believe that this engine has been upped to 450 horsepower. Um, anyway, the boat was doing about eight and a half, nine knots, maybe just under nine knots, and burning about 17 gallons an hour. So it's not a rocket ship. It's not as fast as the 62, but it is more spacious. And so I'm about five foot ten, so you've got about just over, probably just over six feet. What are you? Six two. Six. Yeah, so Matthew can just stand up with his head touching the ceiling, so he's at six two. Um, so that gives you an idea of what you've got right here. Obviously, as you move aft, you've got less space, uh, but when you're working on the engine, if you're working on the fuel valves, um, if you're working on doing rake or filter changes or fuel manifolds and what have you, then you've got full standing headroom right here. We've got uh, water maker membranes. There's two water makers on this boat. There's two there, then there's two around the corner. I think that they are probably uh, 800 gallon. Are they 800 or 1200 gallon water makers? Maybe they're 1200. I'll have a look in a second. Uh, this is the coolant recovery tank for the main engine. Uh, the fuel supply it doesn't have a fuel supply manifold like the 62 or the 57 because it has the day tank. So the day tank is gravity feed from the four tanks. We've got a tank here on the port side, which is about a thousand gallons. Got a tank there on the starboard side, which is about a thousand gallons, maybe just over. And then you've got those two forward tanks that are about six, 650 a piece. So that's 12, 13. Yeah, so that's about right. Um, and they all gravity feed. However, you can use the fuel transfer pump to pump fuel into the day tank, which is what I did the other day because I wanted to get a handle on how much I was using for the day. So the fuel pump's under the floor here. There's a timer on it. Basically, I was just drawing fuel out of one of one or other of these uh, engine room tanks, pumping it into the day tank. And every time you do that, it goes through the transfer filter here so it gets polished so that you know that the fuel in the day tank is is clean and polished at that point. But if you know you've got good clean fuel and you're on a long trip, I would probably just gravity feed it. It's one less thing to think about. Um, what else do we have down here? Um, of course, this is a dry stack boat. So some of the Nordhavens, particularly the twins, um, they use the MTU Series 60, which, by the way, is a truck engine, right? This is the original Freightliner engine. Uh, it's called the Million Mile Engine in the Freightliner business, or the 18-wheeler business. The Million Mile Engine. And, you know, it's derated. I, I, I can't, I don't even know what the maximum horsepower that you can pull out of one of these is, but it's po probably pushing a thousand horsepower. I'm sure there's plenty of sportfish guys out there that'll tell, tell you exactly how much horsepower you can pull out of these. A lot. And we are not even taxing it at 400 or 450 horsepower. So. You know, people worry about the MTUs, but the reality is, I think, this is probably going to outlive me. Uh, and especially in this environment, because it doesn't have any salt water going through it. There's no salt water going through the aftercooler or anything. It's all fresh water cooled. Uh, we've got a keel cooler down there. In fact, there's two keel coolers, one's for the aftercooler and one's for the engine itself. Straight six-cylinder turbocharged and... Uh, reliable power plant. We do have a sea chest under here, which uh, feeds all of our saltwater stuff. So even though this is keel cooled, everything else on the boat is raw water cooled. So the generators are raw water cooled. Um, obviously the generators feed from the sea chest, the water makers feed from the sea chest, the wing engine is raw water cooled, this feeds from the sea chest. Um, the hydraulic system here is uh, raw water cooled. There's a, a raw water cooling pump. In fact, there's two of them under there. I think we put in a spare. Yes, there's two side by side. 
those run from the sea chest and they all push water uh, those push water through this heat exchanger here to cool the hydraulics they all come from the sea chest also the air conditioning comes from the sea chest and i gotta tell you anybody that keeps their boat in south florida is asking for trouble when they sit with the sea chest running their air conditioning uh, day in day out and what happens is that that air conditioning flow that raw water flow seawater flow coming through the sea chest feeds the barnacles and as I tell everybody in South Florida in the summertime when the water is 90 to 95 degrees particularly in a marina like this or in Old Port Cove um, the barnacle growth is horrendous uh, if you put your dinghy in the water for three days without paint and you feel the bottom of it you can already feel the barnacles starting to grow so if you feed them with water like you would if you're running your air conditioning all that water is rushing through the sea chest all the time those barnacles grow quickly in fact you can see the remains of the barnacles on the inside of the strainer there i know that one of the guys i think it was glenn the other day cleaned these strainers out but you can see some of the oysters and barnacle feet on the uh, on the sea strainer now i can tell you without a shadow of a doubt if we were in the middle of summer and that was running for a week you probably wouldn't be able to see through the glass because it would be completely lined with barnacles. And the problem with that is, you know, the air conditioner is just one device pulling water through the sea chest. What happens is you, you sit there for a month or two uh, running air conditioning, and if you're not careful, you'll, you'll uh, clog up all the lines with barnacles. And then when you come to leave the dock, you start your generator to keep the air conditioning go going you start your wing engine to get hydraulics the wing as soon as you turn on your hydraulics now you've got your hydraulic cooling pump sucking water and all of those devices sucking more and more water through the sea chest and eventually it gets to the point where the sea chest can't provide enough water for you and everything starts shutting down so what we have done on a number of boats we have not done it on this one but for anybody that likes to be in south florida sitting at the dock in nitrogen rich waters I think with all the golf courses around here and all the runoff that probably contributes to the amount of growth or the growth rate here uh, for those people that want to sit in these marinas running air conditioning it's a good idea to have a separate through hole and uh, and run your air conditioning off of a separate strainer that way if you clog it up the only thing you lose is air conditioning you don't lose the ability to run all your equipment and pull away from the dock alternatively what is it clear line I think we put a clear line in uh, on a couple of boats recently and we were thinking about doing that on this boat also we've got to talk to the new owners about it but uh, that is a system that uses the salt out of the seawater and um, you know puts puts basically puts current through it and turns it into chlorine and injects a little bit of chlorine into the lines just uh, the way your uh, saltwater swimming pool system would work at home and that helps to prevent growth in the lines and the strainers and it seems to work so what else do we got here so the wing engine uh, that runs the hydraulics so we're going to run this every time we pull out we've got uh, hydraulic alternators so let's talk about hydraulic alternators for a little bit there's two of them back there and these were rebuilt for the previous owner the idea of a hydraulic alternator so when the main engine is running and we're crossing oceans uh, we don't necessarily want to have to run an, uh, a generator if you can we got a big inverter system on this boat and much bigger than it was when the boat was new i think we've got uh, two quattro victron quattros uh five kilowatts a piece i believe that's that's what they are so 10 kilowatts at 110 volts um and five kilowatts at 240 volts now if we can keep the batteries charged and if we use these big 250 amp alternators to do that 24 volts keep the batteries charged then the uh, quattros can run a lot of our equipment for us including actually uh, the air conditioning system and so that prevents us from having to start or means that we don't have to start a generator to run air conditioning uh, on, on a long trip and we don't have belts to worry about either unfortunately the the reality is that hydraulic alternators are not as efficient as a belt driven alternator because you're creating a lot of heat with the hydraulic system and you have to dissipate that heat and that heat of course uh, ends up in the oil here and is dissipated by the cooler and in order to do that you have to use power to suck seawater in through the sea chest using these pumps and so the whole thing is quite power hungry and not very efficient 
but it does mean you're not burning up belts. And um, but I think that was probably one of the reasons. There's a number of them that Nordhaven stopped doing hydraulic alternators. Another reason was, and they're probably going to hate me for saying this, but they sort of didn't think it through. And we had a few instances uh, where hydraulic alternators um, let the smoke out. And the smoke, of course, is what keeps them operating properly. Once you let the smoke out, they don't work properly. And that happened to a few clients along the way, well, more than a few. Um, but what happened was people would, let's say they were running their hydraulic alternators and they'd forget to turn them off. They'd come into port or they'd catch a fish and throttle back uh, without turning the hydraulic alternator off. The lack of oil flow on the hydraulic system meant that the hydraulic motors would not have enough flow to spin the alternator at the correct speed and the alternators although they were trying to put out high current their fans at the back weren't spinning fast enough to dissipate all the heat and they would end up burning all the windings up inside and although it wasn't actually catching fire there was smoke some people say where there's smoke there's fire and they it is rather a smelly experience so um so anyway what we did on a number of these Nordhaven started putting these kits together uh, to cut out the field that's what these are these are optical eyes and the eyes look at the uh, the coupling here there's a coupling uh, in here where the hydraulic motors connected to the alternator so there's there's a little bit of um, reflective tape in there and the optical eye looks at the reflective tape and it keeps track of the RPM of the alternator right near right here and so there's a little program in here that if the RPM of the alternator drops below a certain threshold, it cuts the field out. So even though the hydraulic alternator is spinning, uh, there's no field. So it stops putting out current and alleviates the smoke problem. There's probably more information than you need. But it is interesting to know. And if you are looking at a boat with a hydraulic alternator, you really need to understand how they work and what the problems with them are. Now, as I said before, this boat has been converted to lithium. And when you convert a boat to lithium, there's a lot to think about. You've got battery chargers to think about. You've got alternators to think about. You've got uh, inverter chargers to think about. And that was all done on here. So these now are converted. They have a Bolmar regulator that is tied in with the lithium, sy lithium system so that these can optimally charge the lithium ion system and once the batteries are full there's a battery management system that cuts them off and prevents you from cooking the lithium batteries which are very expensive all right there's also a wing engine tank right back here for uh for the wing engine and um i'm going to be brutally honest don't forget to fill it up because when it's empty the wing engine won't run you remember matthew <laughs> i was coming I had been off with some clients doing some teaching and we'd been, you know, having a good old time and I was coming back in the Palm Beach Inlet and I had completely forgotten to, uh, I think I'd been doing some training on maybe a 57 a week or so before and that doesn't have a wing engine tank. This boat does. So I'd been merrily going along and my wing engine tank was empty. And so I came in the inlet, started the wing tank. I think it was a bank holiday weekend and there were boats everywhere. And all of a sudden the wing engine died and I came down here and I was like, oh shoot. So I started the pump, putting uh, fuel into the wing engine tank and then completely forgot that the pump was running. And Matthew comes running out and said, what's all this pink stuff on the deck? Oops. Won't make that mistake again. So, um, I think that's probably everything in this little corner back here. Underneath Matthew is the... Uh, stern thruster there's a tube that runs uh, across under here under the floor and there's a directional <coughs> valve here for the stern thruster these are that's the regulator system for the alternators and then behind here this covers up all the uh, complexities of the hydraulic system the, the bottle there's a behind, behind the bottle here behind the this bottle yeah this bottle is thank you jay is the gear oil for the uh, for the lower unit on the stern thruster. So um, somebody's put a little mark on there. Those seals have been changed. This has got 80-90 uh, gear oil in it. The idea is that it's above the waterline. Waterline on this boat's probably around here somewhere, just under those through holes. And so if you do have a seal leak, the idea is that you lose oil rather than getting water in there. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Should be on your list of things to keep keep check keep a check of. Uh, this is uh, the central back system, um, fire suppression system back here, 
water makers, engine start batteries underneath, and that's a media filter for the water makers back in there. It's nice and bright in here. Everything's been changed to LED, which I think is a must because these lights actually are relatively cheap. All of the existing lights on these older Nordhavens were fluorescent, and when you turn those on running off the inverters and the batteries, they're drawing a lot of juice. When you turn these on, and I think these are maybe 50 bucks a piece or something, I mean, it's really a cheap switch out, and boy, does it make a difference in here. It's super bright. Okay, so another destroyer submarine-type door to the LAS. You got your steering system in the middle there. Pretty good access to that. Although somebody put a toolbox right in front of it, but that's okay. And then we got three chillers for our chilled water system. One of which I think uh, Dan Neese just put in, new. Um, this is all your chilled water loop. And over here behind, <clears throat> you can see it's, this is all chilled. It's gonna be cold water loop and it's all uh, insulated so that it doesn't sweat when it's cold in a very humid environment, which we are in right now. So, um, we have a dive compressor here, and then round the corner, let me take that, round the corner here, we've got uh, a pressure washer, and then we that's the davit motor back there, and the controls for the um, dive compressor, and then, uh, the owner of the boat that put the um, Victron system in, he put another air conditioner back here, which actually keeps everything on the other side. We're going to head over there in a minute. That blows cold air around here because this, with the Victron system, when you've got all that charging going on, 600 amps going into that Victron battery system, it gets pretty warm back here. So uh, there's an extra air conditioner in here that uh, when you're running the generator and charging, you want to run that air conditioner, keep it cool in here, keep uh, cool air blowing on the Victron system. <clears throat> which is over here. <clears throat> so, DC switching back here, battery management here. This is the battery uh, management system for the Victrons. These are the Victron lithium batteries all tucked in the back here. A DC negative bus around the back. We've got extra Skylar chargers there. Those are 100 amps a piece. And then here we've got our quattros. So these are 200 amp chargers each. So we've got 400 amps uh, plus two there, five, 600 amps. Um, yeah, there's a lot of juice flying around back here when you're charging uh, the system back up. And so I'm not gonna get into the ins and outs because I'm sort of just touching on this, like I said up in the pilot house, I'm learning about lithium ion. But when you're pushing that many amps around uh, charging this lithium bank up as quickly as you can like that. There are certain batteries you can't do that with, but uh, according to the owner, these lithium batteries will pretty much take whatever you throw at them. Um, you are going to be dealing with AC ripple, and that can cause issues in your DC system that are difficult to deal with, like lines on TV screens and things like that. Um, the When they put this system together, it, it was sort of, I won't say it was in its infancy, but this is quite a big system. And in order to get rid of those, uh, the AC ripple, um, the owner, who's a very smart cookie, came up with this uh, supercapacitor right here. And maybe I shouldn't even be talking about this because uh, he should probably uh, he'll be looking for royalties. Um, anyway, this solved all the problems, and um, it's a whole nother story. But I'm looking forward to learning more about lithium ion as I go along. Supercapacitors are pretty dangerous pieces of kit, which I have been learning about in case I have to service it at some point. So, back here after uh, doing the walkthrough, hopefully that was informative and useful information. I'm uh, back here at the galley and, uh, you know, a little while ago Jay showed up. Uh, Jay has been working for Yotech now uh, for a little over four years um, in, in all aspects of the, of the company, in parts and in the shop, working on the boats, doing toilet hoses. 
and uh, whatever else we need them to do. But more recently, been sort of getting into sales and learn learning the uh, the sales side of things. Now, Jay has been. How you doing, Jay? Good. Good to see you. Jay has been following the videos uh, that Matthew and I have been putting out intently, and he actually uh, showed up today and he said, hey, we really need to answer some questions that people have been putting uh, in the comments section of these videos. <clears throat> and I thought it was a great idea, so Jay's going to uh, review some of those, or has reviewed some of those questions, and is going to put them to me now, um, and probably put me on the spot, because I'm not quite sure what he's going to ask, but uh, I have seen a lot of these comments, so I'm, I'm pretty sure I know. In fact, I'll probably tell you the first question that I get from almost everybody is how much does it cost to run an old oven? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just probably the most common question I, I have to say. I mean, you've probably been asked the question many times too. So um, that right up there with burn rate. What's the burn rate? What's the burn rate? Yes. So I've tried to incorporate those into the videos sometimes. You know, I forget. Um, but uh, so let's cover question number one, which is what does it cost? What does it cost to run an auto? <clears throat> and you know, I've answered that question many times, so I've sort of practiced that one because the answer is there are a lot of variables involved. Um, you know, and those variables, and when you start to think about it, I mean, it all makes sense, right? I'm going to start telling you, and you're going to go, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, how old is the boat that you're buying? Number one, um, how mechanically inclined are you? Number two, um, do you are you going to take care of your boat yourself? Are you going to employ somebody like Yacht Tech to uh, to help you maintain your boat? Are you going to wash it yourself? Are you going to detail it yourself? Or are you going every time you come in, you're going to hire somebody off the dock? Uh, what's your level of experience? Because depending on your experience level, your interest premium rates will be higher or, or less. I mean, for, for very uh, qualified and experienced folks, um, the, your insurance premiums are going to be considerably less. Do you want to be in South Florida during hurricane season? That's a big one. Um, in fact, I was talking to somebody just the other day uh, that's buying a boat from us, and for them to stay in South Florida doubled their premium doubled their premium uh, just because of hurricane season. And when you think about it, uh, hurricane season is, it's not just about windstorms. If you've ever been to South Florida during hurricane season, you will know that every afternoon you can look at the horizon and see the rain coming. And it's not just rain. There's lightning almost every afternoon here in Florida. This is the lightning capital of the U.S. And so uh, it's not just about windstorms, it's about the fact that the lightning claims go through the roof during hurricane season. And a lightning claim, on a, you saw the bridge up here, you see all the electronics, you can see uh, how much, I mean that lithium system was, was probably over a hundred grand to put it in. If you got struck by lightning, you're probably on a boat like this, you could be talking, you know, $150,000, $200,000 claim. So insurance companies are really trying to encourage people to leave South Florida, which does a number on businesses like ours, you know, because we go from being super busy right now to having uh, a whole bunch of technicians with not very much to do, which is a bit tricky running a business like this when you have that to contend with. Anyway, back to what does it cost? Um, the old adage, 10% of the value of the boat, is sort of, on an older boat, is sort of where I would start. So you pay a million dollars for the boat, you know, was it going to cost you a hundred grand to maintain it? Probably. If you are having a company like Yacht Tech do the work for you, um, if you're having people wash and detail the boat for you regularly, that's another thing. You keep your boat in South Florida and you're going to need to detail more often because the sun here is vicious. Um, dockage is very expensive here in Palm Beach Gardens, not to try and turn people off of coming here, um, but if you go uh, 20 miles up the road to Stewart, where it's shallow, the dockage is probably almost half what it is here in Palm Beach Gardens. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different things to consider. Um, but, and, and when you get to the more expensive boats, I would say, you know, let's take Bravo for instance. So Bravo's going for, you know, 2.1-ish. Uh, um, let's say it's a $2 million boat. If you take the 10%, that's $200,000 a year. 
that's way over what it costs. In fact, I was having this conversation with a 76 owner this morning, coincidentally, with uh, Kevin Massey. And um, he said he way over budgeted and he has been super happy with his 76 that he purchased from us I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago now, probably two years ago. Two years. Yeah, well, time flies. But, uh, you know, he budgeted high and has been very, very happy with, with the numbers and it's le way less than 10%. Uh, to run his boat. But he's also quite, he's very careful, he's a hands-on guy, he does have Yacht, De Yacht Tech do some stuff for him, I think Nordhaven has done a few things for him. Uh, he helps with toilet hoses. And he, and he helps with toilet hoses, so you know he is keeping it well under 10%. I would say that if you budget somewhere between 5 and 10%, you're probably going to be close. Now of course, you know, for a million dollar boat, you're talking, you know, fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. It's it's a big spread, but um, if you budget ten percent, you're probably going to be happy because it'll be less than that. I also know somebody that had a forty-seven uh, that sold it, and the buyers were asking, and he says, I don't know if I should tell him because I think we sold his boat for maybe eight hundred thousand, and he spent a hundred thousand over a hundred thousand dollars looking after his boat the previous year because he was meticulous, and the boat was absolutely spotless um, and so in order to keep the boat that way and if you have a mentality of if it breaks replace it with new then you know you're going to be upwards of the 10 percent mark okay does that answer your question yes I hope. Oh, that was my question that was their question but anyway that answers the question next the um, number of people to comfortably run a boat okay so somebody asked that question I think on the on the 62 video recently and you and I both know because we've both done mm -hmm. uh, a single handing um, that it is possible Jay not uh, by choice <laughs> uh, no um, but it happens and not that I would rush to pull away from the dock uh, without having somebody on board um, I have done it the insurance uh, company as I said in my answer to that person I think would not be very excited about uh, you single-handing the boat, especially if there was a claim. So probably when I, when I did it, I made sure I didn't tell you about it until after it was done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So although we've done it and proven that it can be done, you know, under the right circumstances, um, it's not advisable. But it does go to show that the boats are quite easy to handle. And these boats, if they have a full hydraulics package like this boat, they have variable speed thrusters, they have jog levers that will hold in position. So when I was parking this boat the other day, I, I did show the, uh, the buyer that you can hold, you can actually leave the stick over and it'll hold the boat against the dock so that you can go off and handle lines and what have you. And, and you can speed up or slow down the thruster. So it makes it very easy. Mm -hmm. um, but most of our customers are running this, these boats as couples. And so, and couples can run any of these boats, I would say, with a little bit of practice. We've got lots of customers that buy them with very little experience. And within six months, they're getting comfortable. Um, and sometimes sooner than that. But I would say within a year, they're very, very comfortable and off cruising and, and you know, relatively safely. Um, but we've got customers, we've got couples that run 76s. I would say that the 76 is probably the maximum size that a couple would, would want to run. And the reality is those people that are running 76s, yes, that's George and Pamela, that would be you. You're doing an awesome job. But it's a lot of work, right? I mean, it is a lot of work. Um, we've had uh, we've got Bruno and Beatrice, we've got Doug and Stephanie that did that, and um, we had uh, Kevin, and Kevin and Noella doing it, and Richard and Lorna from Ireland on Spirit of Ulysses, they did it, and their boat was always immaculate, but boy, it's a lot of work to keep the boat clean. So, um, and with a little help from a company like ours, when, when it comes time for haul outs and maintenance and what have you, I mean, you know, that's going to be a necessity, um, but couples can run the boats, yes. no, no question. Uh, the ideal couples boat, probably, I think I said, is probably the 57. I, I think that's an ideal couples boat. Um, you know, some people feel that that's too big for them, and the, there's a lot of couples that have 47s. Um, but yeah, I mean, couples on 40s, 43s, 50s, 57s, 55s, yeah, they're all doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Where's James? That's a, that's a question I get <laughs> every day. Um, I, I mostly say I don't know. James travels a lot. Okay. 
Okay, next question. One last question. What is your favorite Nordhaven? Oh, that's easy. 63, this, no, the 62. 57, I think, actually. But the 64 is really nice. An Ammonite, you know? 76 is, that's a nice boat to be at sea on. Um, so the answer is... Does that answer is, your question? Yeah. <laughs> True or false, multiple choice? <laughs> It's a very, very difficult question to answer. You know, I, st I started this whole thing on the 57th because I, I told everybody that my favorite was the 57th. But, you know, I, I've been very lucky over the years to, uh, to get on all these, all these fantastic Nordhavens. I mean, really, you know, this, this, is, this is definitely one of my favorites. I should never have said the word favorite, really, I think. It's at the top of your list. It's at the top of my list. My list is sort of... There's a lot of Nordhavens pushed to the top of the list. There's a few that I don't like. That's the that was going to be the following question. Yeah. But the problem time, is we need a timer for you to. Be if late. I <laughs> if I tell you if I put on YouTube the boats that I don't like, then there's going to be some unhappy people out there. Yeah. And they're going to be like, but you sold it to us. <clears throat> um, they're all very different, and. Um, I think, I think that the viewers can tell yeah. by my enthusiasm, and it's very difficult to be enthusiastic about something that you're not in love with. Um, if you're a good salesman, you could. But. Well, I honestly, I don't think I am a particularly good <clears throat> salesman. I think, you know, I've sold a lot of boats, but I don't have to work very hard at that because I love the product that I'm selling. Right. right? Absolutely. Um, I believe in the product. Um, I'm, you know, it shines through, right? That's why people like watching the videos because I'm enthusiastic about it. Um, you know, if you watch a video and you detect a lack of enthusiasm, you'll know that that boat's probably not close to the top of the list. How's or if someone else is doing the video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, any more questions? Or is that the final one? I'll read the comments from this video and and get some more questions out. That's right. Anyway, next. Uh, I think that's it. Really? I mean, we can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of questions. The, all, all the other questions have been covered in earlier videos, and they just um, cycle back through that it would be uh, repeating some things that you've already answered yeah, in other videos. Yeah, I try and do my best. You know, it, we when the video first hits, you know, Matthew sort of watches uh, the comments. Actually, the comments have been really pretty positive, and mm -hmm. so I'm happy about that. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we watch those comments to begin with quite closely and then, you know, a month or two into it, we don't watch them as much. Every once in a while I pop on there just to, and I'll answer a couple of questions. I'll do my best, but to really appreciate the feedback. Um, we will continue to do the videos. I think it'll be easier in the off season. It just has been crazy busy down in here. I think we, at one point we had like 12 boats under contract and, uh, it mm -hmm. just, just, and, and of course we're in busy season as well with the service company. So. A lot going on, but uh, we'll be up in Anac I'll be up in Anacortes this summer, and hopefully Matthew and I'll get the opportunity to do a, a, a few more boats and get them out to you. I know that we're good. We did uh, start doing a 55 for you, but it didn't go very well, and we had to scrub that. So we'll get back on the 55 again at some point, and uh, and do that for you, Brian Finn. Um, anyway, I think that's it for us uh, for this time. I don't know where we're at. We're probably at the two-hour mark. Probably had enough for had enough for one walkthrough. Um, I'm James Knight. This is Jay, Matthew behind the camera, Yacht Tech. Have a great day, and we'll see you in the next video.